Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Thursday, December 1st, we are studying the hymn, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. That's hymn number 336 in Lutheran Service Book. This hymn from Charles Wesley is one of the best examples to remind us that Advent is not only about helping us to prepare for Christmas. Advent helps us to prepare for Christ's coming on the last day. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor James Preuss. Pastor Preuss serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Ottumwa, Iowa. Pastor Preuss, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Thank you. So, Pastor Preuss, as we get started today, let's talk just a little bit about the season of Advent. As I mentioned in the introduction, I think this is one of the hymns of Advent that really helps us to to see Advent as more than pre-Christmas. When you think about the season of Advent, its role in the church year and and in the Christian's life, what's the importance of Advent? What's Advent all about? Well, I always look at the theme of Advent from the word Advent, which means coming or arrival, uh, and it's always Jesus' arrival. Jesus is coming, uh, and he comes in three ways. Uh, the, the one we see in Scripture when he is incarnate uh, in, in the womb of the Virgin Mary, becomes man, and suffers and dies for our sins here on earth before he ascends into heaven. So that's his first coming. Uh, we, we often say his second coming is his return, but we really have a, a, a second coming now, like at least in this category, uh, of him coming by his means of grace. So Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of you. Uh, so Christians believe that Jesus comes to us today. Uh, and we, we talk about Jesus being omnipresent, meaning that he is present everywhere. Uh, but he's not present everywhere with his grace, so to speak. So he comes to us when his gospel is proclaimed, uh, when sins are forgiven according to his word, when people are baptized, when we receive the Lord's Supper. Uh, this is how Jesus comes to us today. And then, of course, uh, the, the third category of his coming or arrival, uh, which is, as I mentioned before, uh, frequently called his second coming, uh, we prepare for Christ to return on the clouds and to judge the living and the dead. Uh, this is a major theme in Scripture, and it's a major theme in Christianity and in the church year, both at the uh, end of the church year, the end of the week of Trinity or, or Pentecost, uh, and uh, the the end of, end, end of the year or end of uh, end time theme but also in Advent, which I think catches some people a bit by surprise when they think about it. Uh, It's a a great contrast uh, to Jesus coming meekly as a baby, uh, is him coming with great power and might uh, to judge the living and the dead. Mm. Why why do we need that dual focus? And and again, I appreciate you bringing up that middle coming, the one now. But but particularly thinking about, for example, the the hymn that we looked at previously, you know, the the coming of the Lord on Palm Sunday, the first Sunday in Advent. Thinking about his his coming in lowliness. Today we're going to talk a lot more about his coming in power and might. How did those two comings? Well, and I guess you can mix in the other one too. <laughs> How do they all relate to each other? Why do we need all those? And, and particularly in Advent, the beginning of the church year. Well, right. Uh, They're all connected in Jesus' crucifixion and death Mm. for our sins. When Jesus comes as a baby, uh, I mean, everyone likes the the nativity scenes. We like to have the the wise men come and bring uh, Jesus' gold, saints, and some myrrh, and the angels, and the shepherds. It's all quite nice. But we can't celebrate Christmas without looking to the cross. 
and that the reason why God took on human flesh, even that human flesh of that Google baby in the manger, is so that that flesh may be pure and shed uh, blood to make atonement for the sins of the whole world. Jesus is a sacrifice. That is why he has come. That's what the angel told Joseph. He said, his name shall be Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Uh, this is what the prophets were told uh, when they said that they would look on him who they have pierced, and by his stripes he are healed. Uh, and that same cross has to be in view when we look at Jesus' return. Uh, it's scary to imagine a divine being, or the divine being, returning with cl- on clouds uh, in great power. Uh, it, it's enough to, to scare someone to death and to hope that it doesn't come. And I've, I've heard even Christians say this, well, I hope it doesn't come in my lifetime. They, they think it would be less scary to face their own death than to be alive when Christ comes. Hmm. Uh, I don't know, somehow they think that after they die they'll have more courage, I guess. Uh, but when Jesus comes, this is something that's very much emphasized to him, we always look at his cross and see him as coming as the one who was crucified for our sins. As we read in Hebrews 9, that he who suffered will come again, not to deal with us, uh, deal with our sins, but to, uh, but, uh, to save those who uh, eagerly wait for his coming. So uh, the, 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 the connection between his first coming and his second coming is the cross, which again is why I mentioned his, his as you mentioned, that the uh, intermediate coming, the coming in grace, is always the cross, always the preaching of the gospel that, uh, that connects us. So um, people were able to ignore Jesus' first coming. Uh, they were able to despise him. Uh, but uh, nobody is going to be able to ignore his second coming. Nobody is going to be able to despise him and, and reject him and, and cast them off. Uh, but those who received him will, in faith, uh, those who, uh, who look to his cross for salvation will be very happy to see him come. Uh, but it, those who did reject him when he came in humility, uh, as this hymn says, they will be deeply wailing. Mm. Yeah, this, this hymn will help us to see the, the difference between those two groups when he comes. How, how is it that, if I can borrow from the language of the previous hymn we looked at, how is it that we will be able to meet him with joy and thanksgiving and meet him aright on the last day? It's only through faith in what he has done through in the first time that he came in that humility and his death, always keeping our, our focus, as you said, at Christ's cross, where we see him as the Savior, when we recognize what he's done and, and place our faith in what he's done in that coming, then the coming on the last day becomes a day of joy and anticipation and one that we we look forward to with great longing and joy. I, I, I can't remember who told me this, but I, I thought it was a helpful one, that the, the season of Advent the best advent that there could be is one that doesn't actually make it to Christmas because the Lord returns first. And, and that I think really, I can't remember who told me that. I wish I knew, but I, I think that really captures the the theme of advent very well, that we're looking forward to that second coming. And that's our greatest longing. I do think this hymn will help us to express that longing in, in poetic fashion. Right. Well, absolutely. And I think uh, with that in mind, when Christmas does come and when Christ does not return her that, is what happens. Uh, you're much better prepared for Christmas because you realize why this is such a big deal. Yeah. Uh, because uh, this is what makes his his second coming uh, the wonder. So, Pastor Price, as we prepare to look at this hymn, number 336 in Lutheran Service Book, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending, give us uh, any background information, historical information on the text, the author. Or we're looking at a Charles Wesley hymn. He's a, a pretty well-known English hymn writer. Right. He, he may be the best-known English hymn writer. Uh, now, I, you know, for full disclosure, I am a Lutheran hymn chauvinist. I think that Lutheran <laughs> hymns are the, are the best, and if we only sing Luther, uh, hymns written by Lutherans for the rest of my life, I would be perfectly happy. And this isn't just my opinion, it's just a fact that Lutherans have the best theology. There's no surprise that they have uh, the best hymns. So I love it. I would take Paul, Paul Gerhardt and Philip Nikolai over Charles Wesley uh, every, every day of the week. All that being said, um, 
especially in our context, we're English-speaking Lutherans, and we've been English-speaking for, for quite a while. And we look at the dates of Charles Wesley. So if you have your LSB, your Lutheran service book, it says right there he was born in 1707 and died in uh, 88. Uh, so most of his life was before the uh, United States even became a country. Uh, I mean, this is just about uh, 200 years after the Reformation. And uh, one of the challenges that the American Lutheran Church has had is that so many of our writings and our hymns have been in German. Well, but the nation, you know, be, the, the Lutherans in the nation, uh, began to speak English more and more and more. So they needed music. So our, our uh, American Lutheran history is very much tied in to the Anglican Church in their hymnody, uh, and, and in their liturgy as well. So, uh, for example, at Matins and Vespers, very much borrows from, from, uh, the, from the Anglican liturgy. Uh, so, Charles Wesley is very influential. Uh, he was a compulsive hymn writer. He wrote hymns for everything. It is said that he wrote over 6,500 hymns in his life. Uh, his brother is John Wesley, uh, who is known for being the founder of the Methodist Church. However, Charles never joined uh, the Methodist Church. I have a quote here. I got it from um, hymnary.org, and this is actually a quote from the direct, uh, Dictionary of Hymnology. It says that uh, Wesley, Charles Wesley said, uh, oh, shoot, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose. Oh, here it is. He says, I have lived and I die in the communion of the Church of England, and I will be buried in the yard of my parish church. So he uh, never became a Methodist, although he was an itinerary preacher. He, he, he walked around and, and uh, uh, would, would preach to different congregations. Uh, he spent a brief time in, in Georgia and the United States. He spent most of his ministry in England. Uh, the, the Dictionary of Hymnology, uh, which again was quoted by org, says that they, they counted over 400 hymns, 482 hymns that he and his brother either wrote or translated, and the vast majority of those are from Charles himself. And a few other hymns that Lutherans uh, may know and love uh, would be Hark the Herald Angels Sing, the Christmas hymns, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, uh, which is a, an Easter hymn, uh, Love Divine, All Love Excelling, the Love Divine, All Love Excelling. So people uh, generally, those, those are people pleasers, <laughs> and I, I mean, not to degrade them, but people who sure do love those hymns. Mm. So, um, yeah, he's not Lutheran, he's Anglican. Uh, his theology, especially in the hymns that we sing, is, is good, it's sound, that's one of the reasons why we like it, it's beautiful. Uh, so I would say, I guess, my opinion would be that Charles Wesley would be about the best English-speaking uh, hymn writer, uh, uh, non Lutheran hymn writer post Reformation. So, um, you know, we Lutherans will claim hymns of their own before the Reformation if they're good. After the Reformation, you know, we should like to stick to our Lutheran hymns, but uh, we do borrow quite a bit from Wesley. And although Methodism has some serious problems and Church of England has serious problems, uh, there are some very good hymns that Charles Wesley has written in. And I would say this is one of them. Yeah, I, I would agree with that assessment. And, and that, that this one, and then Hark the Herald Angels Sing, another one that you mentioned by Charles Wesley, I think is another one that, that does a nice job of of bringing really solid theology into the text. It, and as you said, it, man, give me a Paul Gerhardt text any day. But I, this is this is a pretty good one. So it's, it's maybe not your favorite Advent hymn, but it's 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 near there. What, what is your favorite Advent hymn, Pastor Price? Oh, goodness. Well, well Lord, how shall I meet yeah. the... Is- Probably my favorite, although one I really, really love is Comfort, Comfort, You, My People, mm-hmm. which I know is just a paraphrase of Isaiah 40, but it's just, uh, I really love that. Very good. Very good. All right. So so we get to look at Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. We'll look at it, the four stanzas that are given. Any just introductory comments? Generally speaking, what is this hymn going to be teaching us? Well, we already talked about it. Uh, it's an Advent hymn, uh, the theme of coming, and specifically the return of Christ. Uh, I have a, I don't know where I got this document. It must have been, I assume it was produced by people who worked with the Lutheran Service Book, because the document has like, you know, 
victims of the day from mm. from LSD. Uh, but it, it's uh, the suggested hymn of the day for Advent 2, and the gospel lesson for uh, for Advent 2 is Luke 21, 25 through 36. Is it okay if I read that text? Go for it. All right. And there will be signs and sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, Straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And he told them a parable, look at the fig tree and all the trees, as soon as they come out in leaf, you see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Uh, I, I really think that Wesley probably was thinking of this direct text when he wrote uh, this hymn, perhaps even for this particular Sunday. I, I really wouldn't be surprised if he wrote it for the occasion of Advent 2. I mean, he was a pastor, and uh, the, the lectionary is shared um, you know, interdenominationally. Uh, but i there will be other texts that we'll bring up, but that right there is pretty much what this, this Tim is about. All right, so Luke 21 is going to be in the background. As you said, that's the text for Advent 2, the second Sunday in Advent in the one-year historic lectionary. It also shows up at the end of the church year. If you use the three-year lectionary, you would have recently heard this in church. It's in the, the second to last Sunday in the church year. It's the gospel reading. And, and there you see how the, you know, the church year, it ends with this focus on Christ's return, and then it begins with a similar focus on Christ's coming, that second coming. That's what we get in the hymn, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending, written by Charles Wesley. This is stanza one. Lo, He comes with clouds descending, once for every sinner slain. Thousand, thousand saints attending swell the triumph of his train. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Christ the Lord returns to reign. That's stanza one of hymn 336 in Lutheran service book, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. So, Pastor Preuss, just to get the very first word out of the way, it says, lo, and there's an exclamation point after it. What, is, what does that mean? It means look. <laughs> so, yeah, it means look. Behold, look, Jesus is coming. You can see him with your own eyes. Hmm. Uh, this is what Jesus says will happen. Every, every eye will see him. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind is uh, once for every sinner slain. This mm. very much brings Jesus' words that, you know, lift up your head because your redemption is drawing near. That's exactly what Wesley is trying to uh, get us to think of, is uh, what does redemption mean? Well, it means that he purchased our salvation. To redeem is to purchase. And as you know from Luther's small catechism, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, or you know, from First Peter, um, that uh, uh, he, he says that we were ransomed, uh, not with silver or gold, but with the holy pressure of precious blood of, of Christ uh, as, as of a lamb. So uh, uh, that's what he's, he's talking about very much. We get all the imagery from Luke 21, uh, that our redemption is drawn near, once for every sin is slain, uh, and that's what we should keep our, our eyes on, is that he's come as our seed, come as the crucified one. Mm. So we're actually looking for this to happen. I'm reminded of the language of the, the Nicene Creed where we say, I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. There's a, 
th- this hymn ties in very nicely to that, even with that, just that very first word that, again, sometimes we, we miss in English because we're not used to saying it that way. But, you know, look for this. This is something we're expecting, we're anticipating it. And, and so, yeah, keep your, lift up your heads, as Jesus says. This is the, the Christian hope. We actually are looking for it, not just kind of twiddling our thumbs, waiting around. But this is, this is something we, we're actively anticipating. Right. And, and then you have this beautiful imagery of thousands and thousands of saints attending uh, swell the triumph of his train. So you can imagine this gigantic uh, multitude, this great crowd that is kind of moving as a wave, and they're both following him, and then they're greeting him. Very much uh, mm. like his triumphal entry, but those following him would be those from the dead, and those who are greeting him would be those who are still alive. And of course, we all meet the him together in the air, uh, as Scripture says. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a train uh, that I think that should remind us of Ephesians 4, where he says that he leads a train of captives, uh, that he's, he's, he's rescuing us from sin and death and hell. Uh, another thing I would point out is the Alleluia, Alleluia, because those same notes, if you look right below it in verse 2, you're going to have that deeply wailing, deeply wailing. And those two, he did that very purposefully. Mm. This uh, is a great contrast between those who are welcoming him in faith and those who despised him. Mm. Before we get too far from that second line, once for every sinner slain, the Lutheran service book Companion to the Hymns, published by Concordia Publishing House, uh, makes a note that the original language that Wesley used there was he wrote once for favored sinners slain, and that was that was altered in in Lutheran hymnals to say once for every sinner slain. According again to the the companion to the hymns, Char- Charles Wesley himself was not a Calvinist in terms of his his view of the atonement being limited to only those who are elect. But the the change was made lest any confusion be given by this hymn that Christ, in fact, died for every sinner and not just for the elect. Right. Yeah, and, and that's something, again, I mean, um, I don't want people to think that I'm too critical, uh, but it, it's, again, one, one of the reasons why we do emphasize Lutheran hymns, um, and, and not denigrate this hymn, but uh, Lutherans have the best theology, uh, the best hermeneutic, that is, that is interpretation of Scripture, and uh, and it's why we are always careful. There are some hymns that we mine outside of our, you know, Lutheran uh, body, but uh, but we always have to be careful. And I think it is better safe than sorry when uh, correcting or, or clarifying language, because the purpose of these hymns is, is part of the purpose of these hymns is to teach. And I think there are, that hymns probably are responsible for as much or more teaching than sermon, uh, especially when they're sung over and over and over again. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, when you get that tune stuck in your head and the words accompany it, you want those words to be sound words, the healthy doctrine of the scriptures and not unhealthy doctrine of uh, that is false and misleading. And so very important to sing faithful hymns and, and to sing that Christ has been slain once for every sinner is a fantastic reminder of the gospel that Christ died for all, which means he died for you. Those thousand, thousand saints attending to swell this train of his, you mentioned Ephesians 4. I don't know if you, you said it, but I think you referenced it. First uh, Thessalonians 4, the, the picture of those who, who are alive at the time and those who've died, both of them, both of those groups greet Christ and, and return with him. We, we've got that imagery there from, from 1 Thessalonians 4. Any other uh, scripture texts that stand behind this this first stanza? Uh, well, I'll mention it again, but Revelation 7, I mean, mm. that's that great uh, All Saints Day uh, hymn. And really, I mean, I think that's another reason why this hymn is so popular. Uh, I looked on hymnary.org. I think that's hymnary.org. I hope I'm not saying it wrong. Yeah, hymnary.org, which is like a non, like a volunteer thing, I think. Although they ask for donations as well. Um, but they, uh, they, they have 733 hymnals that this hymn is in. So it's, it's very oh. popular, but also there are lots of Sundays in the church here where it's appropriate to sing. So All Saints Day, you mentioned, was well, the second to last Sunday in uh, the church year, both for the three year and for the one year. 
Mm. Uh, so there are lots of opportunities where this hymn matches up with one or more of the of the texts uh, for that Sunday. Mm. And just one more note on the on the first stanza, as you mentioned, the word Alleluia shows up three times here in this first stanza and also in stanza four, as we will see. That's one of those words that we say so often as Christians that perhaps we forget. What does the word Alleluia actually mean? Yeah, Alleluia comes from the Hebrew, uh, Hallelujah, which means praise uh, Yahweh, praise the Lord. Uh, so if you were in Sunday school and you had a music teacher who taught you you know, the song where they have hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord, and then you have the boys stand up for praise ye right. the Lord, and the girls stand up for hallelujah. Anyway, my teacher did that to me. And I we, we did it too, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So you're actually saying the same thing twice, hallelujah and praise ye the Lord, the same thing. Right. So it's, yeah, so the point is to teach the kids what the word means. So That's right. long before I like, got, uh, uh, you know, probably uh, close to two decades before I ever took the Hebrew class, I knew a hallelujah meant. There you go. Uh, because that's what it's called. And it's generally a word that I think we associate with the season of Easter, particularly if if you observe the tradition of not saying the word Alleluia during Lent and then bringing it back during Easter. It's, it's a word that we often associate with that season, but it fits very well here when we think about the return of Christ. Yeah, interestingly enough, too, because Advent, uh, like Lent, is a season of, of is a penitential season. Mm. So, of course, I mean, not saying Alleluia, saying Alleluia, I mean, these are these are traditions of, of men, I mean, of the Church. So, you know, we're free on whether we actually um, practice those or not. Although, I mean, there is there is a time and place for restrained celebration, and I think it is good for us. Right, right. But here is a good time to make use of the word Alleluia, to praise the Lord as we anticipate his return. We're going to keep looking at this hymn on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We are talking about hymn number 336 in Lutheran Service Book with Pastor James Preuss this morning. We will be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, December 1st. We are studying the hymn, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. That's number 336 in Lutheran Service Book. And our guest this morning is Pastor James Preuss. He serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Ottumwa, Iowa. We were looking at stanza one prior to the break. Now we turn to stanza two. Every eye shall now behold him robed in glorious majesty. Those who set at naught and sold him, pierced and nailed him to the tree, deeply wailing, deeply wailing, deeply wailing, shall their true Messiah see. That is stanza two of the hymn, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. Pastor Preuss, what are we, what are we singing about here? Well, as in contrast of the first stanza, where it focuses pretty much on the saints, on the Christians witnessing Jesus coming, uh, with Alleluia, he's now emphasizing that it won't just be Christians, it won't just be believers who will witness his coming, but it will be all people, including those who rejected him. And stanza two is very much a paraphrase of two uh, passages of Scripture. One is Revelation 1-7 that says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him 
and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. And then also of uh, Zechariah 12, verse 10, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over the firstborn. And then you also have uh, John nineteen thirty seven, uh, which quotes that they will look on him whom they have pierced to talk about Jesus suffering. So I think Revelation one seven is more of what it is, mm. uh, more what is quoting Zechariah twelve ten. I think speaks more of the actual Christians mourning the death of Christ uh, before his resurrection. But Revelation one seven uh, talks about his return, and it it uh, invokes that prophecy that they will look on him whom they appear uh, as uh, as those who rejected him and then it has that you know that deeply wailing that uh, and all the chaps uh, on the earth of the earth will wail on account of him so that's where we get that uh, that phrase deeply wailing deeply wailing deeply uh, deeply wailing shall they their true Messiah sees. he's everyone's Messiah. I mean, he's the anointed one for all. But uh, there's a great contrast between those who greet him with hallelujahs and those who greet him with wails of of uh, bear. So the the wailing, because that that does stand out, particularly in the the tune that's given and the way that you repeat it three times. The the wailing that's happening in stanza two is a wailing of. And tell me if this if I'm if I'm understanding this correctly. It's a wailing of uh, finally realizing that the one you rejected all along, he actually is the true Christ, the true Messiah. And so there's a a wailing of despair over knowing that you were wrong, and that means your eternal fate is is judgment. Is that right? Uh, right. I mean, he, he gets the word from Revelation 1-7, which says the word wailing. And it very much connects with what Jesus uh, often says when he speaks to those who are going to be sent to hell. And he says that this is where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And uh, that description very much talks about, it's not just simply, you know, being in terrible pain, you know, the kind of caricatures of how, I mean, I'm sure there is terrible pain, uh, but they're, they're gnashing their teeth. That's something that someone does when they're, uh, when they're upset. It's like, you know, someone uh, who, who just lost a million dollars, or someone who, you know, obviously those are like, trivial compared to this, but uh, yeah, they, they're, there's great regret, there's anger, there is, um, uh, it, it, it's pregnant with emotion, uh, and that uh, I suppose isn't isn't all the same. But uh, these are those who they were told they were told at that time, and uh, and then they ignored it. And uh, I think it's something that you know we as Christians don't want to say you told I told you so, but um, I think people who do ignore the gospel, ignore the warning of, of the law, uh, should consider that, that we don't want to have that feeling of, uh, I told you so, or someone saying that to you, that you were warned, and have you thrown away that warning? Um, you don't, you know, we don't have an excuse for rejecting the gospel. Nobody has an excuse, but especially not those who over and over and over again heard the gospel proclaimed. Uh, so here, I mean, we have the uh, the image of those who physically were there when Jesus was pierced, as, uh, as they were crying, "Crucify him! Crucify him!" Uh, yeah, everyone who has heard the gospel and rejected it has joined those who cried, "Crucify him!" and uh, despised the blood of Christ. Mm. I'm glad you you use that language of we don't want to think about this as a I told you so verse, but but it almost does seem like a stanza of of gloating. That was the word that I wrote down. Is is this gloating? I I don't right. think so. But what I mean, what what is the function of this stanza for the Christians who sing it? Then I mean, why why do we why do we sing a stanza like this that speaks about the way unbelievers will experience the last day? 
Right, and you know, and this is criticism that I've heard of this hymn by Lutheran pastors. One of the reasons why, you know, not everyone does like this hymn. And one of the reasons is because it says, ah, hallelujah, ah, hallelujah. I mean, it's very cheerful. And then you have this, the very next verse, deeply wailing, deeply wailing, deeply wailing. I mean, it sounds like you are, it's like a jig, you're, you're, you're celebrating them. Uh, so I suppose maybe you can, as you sing the the uh, the tune, uh, have a little bit more of sobriety uh, and uh, you know uh, sternness when you sing it than with the hallelujahs. Uh, sing it mournfully. Uh, so I mean, and that's one of the things with music is. Uh, Music isn't relative. It's not subjective. It, it does actually have uh, an objective meaning to it. And uh, that being said, it's not uh, it's in, immovable. It's not immalleable. But I think we can sing the same notes uh, in, in great celebration and then also sing those notes in uh, in, in great solemnness. Mm. Um, it, although I do think it's difficult, and, and that is one of the things I find difficult uh, with this hymn. You're, you're not gloating, uh, but we are proclaiming that they will be deeply wailing. And, um, and it's, it's, it's as certainly true as the fact that we will be praising and singing hallelujah. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's how I would say it. it, it is, uh, you're going to be seeing, you can't help but sing hallelujah in a very peppy way. But maybe as you're singing, pay attention to the words. And uh, maybe not be so upbeat when you sing, you know, deeply wailing. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a terrible, terrible thing yeah. that we are proclaiming. But it's very, very true. Right. And, and I mean, I think in that sense, when, when the Christian sings this stanza, it is a reminder of the, the seriousness of what we're talking about, that we're not, I mean, when we think about the return of Christ, uh, we, we need to have faith to be prepared for that day. Again, oh Lord, how shall I meet you to, to go back to Gerhardt? The only way we can do that is if he kindles the lamp of faith in our hearts. And if we reject that gift, stanza two is what we face. And so there is a, a reminder, a, a warning, lest we would spurn this great gift. And it's, I mean, you know, it's, it's not just Charles Wesley that writes this way. It, one of the hymns that we sang at the end of the church here, the day is surely drawing near. That's number 508 in Lutheran service book. It includes right. stanzas just like this, you know, woe to those who scorn the Lord and sought but carnal pleasures. It goes on to talk about being delivered to Satan at the end. I mean, so it's it's not just the Anglican hymn writers that, that write this way. There's Lutheran hymn writers that write this way too as a as a warning to us, lest we despise the precious gift we've been given. Yeah, right, absolutely. And, and I think this is an important thing that we don't omit from our preaching, but also from our hymns. And sometimes the hymns can be very helpful to get people to understand that. So the hymn you just mentioned, we sang that on the second to last Sunday of the church year too. Um, another great hymn is Lo Many Shall Come from the East and the West. Mm. And interestingly enough, uh, I choose it from TLH. So we have copies of TLH still in our church. We use LSB, but we'll, I'll, I always have a thing from TLH, Lo Many Shall Come from the East and the West, because they took the uh, uh, LSB, and uh, probably losing worship, took out the second stanza, which says, but they who have always resisted his grace and on their own virtue depending shall then be condemned and cast out from his face, eternally lost and unfriending. Now, I don't know if that's why they took it out. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to give a bad motive, but it's, in a, it's important that we don't leave it out. Uh, and uh, these, these hymns do give us an opportunity to say very clearly uh, some of the hard things that we need to say. And that is that those who reject Christ, who reject His grace, are going to go to hell. Mm. Uh, and uh, we're not playing around. So when your pastor says, uh, you know, you should go to church more often, uh, he's not, I mean, he's not just trying to get you to be a customer, like a salesperson. He's concerned about your eternal soul. When he says, you have to get your kid baptized, uh, I mean, playing around is if, oh, well, yeah, no, no, no. yeah God's not going to send my baby to hell. Well, I don't know. He might, or maybe he'll send you to hell for not baptizing your kid. So uh, we have to be very, very um, serious about the fact that hell exists, damnation is real, not everyone's going to go to heaven, 
And, uh, and sometimes singing these hymns can be very helpful because, as you said, you get caught in your head. And then uh, maybe it'll get you to stop and think about uh, the seriousness of it all. Mm. Yeah. The, the other thing that I, I think is maybe within this stanza that, that sometimes, it, maybe it's not right on the, the surface, but I think if we think about some of the biblical texts and the ways that, that this theme comes up, is there is a, a sense, especially as you go forward in this hymn, there's a sense of, of vindication for the Christian that, that those who publicly rejected Christ and the gospel in this life, they may seem to succeed right now, but on the last day, the, the faith of the Christian is proved to be true. And there's there's hope, there's vindication in that, that I think sustains the Christian to you know keep fighting the good fight right now, because on the last day, and, and that's where I think this hymn is going to take us, of course, that on the the last day we will see our savior in glory and in honor and and what joy there will be so that sustains us in the midst of the fight right now yeah uh, yeah absolutely and i think it helps us also see where our victory is i mean so we just got over the mm. election season people get so um caught up in it you know i think that the 2020 election uh hit harder hit the church harder than uh, than COVID, where you know all these people are being kept away from going to church because they're afraid of this virus. Uh, the 2020 election, I think a lot of Christian conservative Christians got their hopes set on some man or men or men and women as if they were going to save us. Our victories are not in the election. Our victories are not how much money we make. Our victories are not dashed to pieces because evil people succeed on earth. Our victory is in Christ, and that uh, victory is certain. Uh, he's not going to fail. Mm, that's right. That's right. Let's continue then with stanza three. Those dear tokens of his passion, still his dazzling body bears, cause of endless exultation to his ransomed worshipers. With what rapture, with what rapture, with what rapture, gaze we on those glorious scars. That again is stanza three of the hymn, Lo, he comes with clouds descending. So those dear tokens of his passion, what are the tokens of Christ's passion that Wesley mentions in the third stanza? Well, the, the marks of the nail in his hands and feet and the, uh, the scar, the pierce of the, the mark of the spear in his side. Uh, he's taken a bit of liberty to assume that Jesus' scars are still going to be there at the return. Um, I don't think there's any passage in Scripture that explicitly states that. However, I think it's a good theological point to make. And I personally believe it's true. I do believe that when Jesus returns, we will see those scars. And that is how we will recognize him. Mm. Uh, and uh, the reason why I believe that is because that is what he did after his resurrection, both in Luke's Gospel and in John's Gospel. He showed his disciples his hands and his feet, and that is the moment when they rejoice. Uh, also, we have in Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says, uh, it says that by his stripes we are healed. Mm. And I think that God is going to grant us a, a vision of those stripes so that we know that we are healed, that he who is coming with our redemption has healed us. Uh, also, I, I think there is maybe is some, something implicit uh, where he says that, I will see him, even those who pierced him, that maybe that's an indication that, that the mark of the piercing uh, is still there. So I, I like to talk about the scars of Christ with my people. Um, I think it's why crucifixes are and uh, paintings of Jesus on the cross are helpful art. Uh, and uh, I always call these scars the receipt of our salvation, that Jesus' blood purchased us, it redeemed us, and uh, those scars are the receipt that he has done it. Uh, I think it is beautiful that Christ, whose body is incorruptible and has been uh, restored to the glory that, that, that it deserves, because he is God, uh, still bears those scars mm. uh, uh, to proclaim the eternal gospel, that he has done it, that he has, uh, that he has won our salvation. Mm. So I think it's a beautiful verse. 
Uh, and I, I really do like the, the discussion of these scars and that we will gaze upon them, that we should preach them now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, you know, so to the to the, the point on, on Jesus' body bearing the scars, I think, I mean, Revelation 5 in several places talks about Jesus as the lamb who was slain and even even seeing him in that way. And so I, I think, I mean, yeah, I, I, I would say that I would be right with you that we would expect to see Jesus' scars. And I forget, I think it's in Isaiah, maybe 44 or 45, where, where the Lord says that he has engraved us on the palm of his hands. And I... Yeah. I've always taken that as a reference to the scars of Christ as well. Again, leading me to think that, yes, the way that he identified himself to Thomas and to the other disciples after Easter is the same way that we will know him too. And and when we see those scars, this is what I, I find amazing is that, you know, those scars, which you, you might think, wow, I, I, all that Christ went through, how horrifying yet as this hymn suggests and the way that Thomas reacts, certainly in John 20, this is a joyful, a rapturous moment to use the language of the hymn. Our, our joy is to see Christ as the one who was, was crucified for us. And I, I mean, I love how it functions in the hymn because if, if you coming out of stanza two, it's a rather terrifying thing to consider Christ. How will I ever receive him with joy? It's when I see the scars and realize that's what he did for me so that I might be welcomed by him on the last day instead of cast aside forever. Right. And, that, I mean, and that's how scripture speaks. You know, uh, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how much more will he graciously give us all things? How can he who comes bearing the scars uh, of, of his passion for our sake come to send us to hell. Uh, so and we who gaze upon those scars today in faith, I think we will be very excited to see them when he comes in glory. Uh, I, I think it's going to it's going be the most beautiful sight. Uh, this is what he has done uh, out, of, out of love for us. Uh, and I mean, I don't know, if, I don't know what to compare it to. I mean, I suppose perhaps someone bears a scar because he has uh he rescued someone. I can't really think of another example. I suppose maybe a war hero or something, or maybe a <laughs> maybe a mother who mm. had such marks. Mm. Uh, but uh, uh, this is, uh, I think, it's a very beautiful, a beautiful thing, and I think every Christian should think of that. That Jesus' scars are wonderful mm. because uh, this is what He did out of love for us. And you know, Isaiah fifty-three: By His stripes we are healed; yeah. by His wounds we are healed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, the the hymn I think, "Oh Sacred Head Now Wounded," is a, is a wonderful example of of a Christian meditating upon the scars of Christ. That's a Lenten hymn, but you even within that Lenten hymn, you see the joy to recognize that this head that was wounded for me, I mean, that's that's my salvation. This one right here, who has died for me, here is my salvation. And now in this hymn, to come back in glory to take me to live forever in the resurrection with Him. Let's, uh, let's move on to stanza four. This is the final stanza of the hymn. Yea, amen, let all adore thee, high on thine eternal throne. Savior, take the power and glory, claim the kingdom as thine own. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Thou shalt reign and thou alone. That's stanza four of the hymn, Lo, he comes with clouds descending. How does Wesley use the stanza to wrap things up for us? Well, he's, He's taken the words from Scripture. So in Revelation chapter 7, uh, the, all, all the people from every a great mm. multitude that no one can number, from every nation and tribe, people and language, who stand for the throne, for the Lamb, close my rose, and will be shouting, salvation belongs to our God and to who sits on the throne to the Lamb. Uh, and then they will, they will sing, Amen. This is verse 12. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God, forever and ever. Amen. So there he uses that word, uh, amen. Amen, as, as you who know your, your small catechism know, means yes, yes, it shall be so. Uh, so this is true. This is true. And the glory belongs to, to Christ alone. He is our God. He is victorious. He will be on the throne forever and ever and ever. And we will, without stopping, singing his praises. Like, I mean, I don't know what heaven is going to be like exactly. Uh, I mean, are we literally going to be just singing around the throne forever and ever? I mean, if that's what heaven is, then fine. Uh, I mean, 
we will, we will love it. But uh, our hearts, at least, will be doing that. I mean, I don't know what activities are, are preparing for us in heaven, but uh, at least not every, you know, I don't know what the schedule is. Uh, <laughs> but I know that we will be singing his praises, and we will be glorifying him, and we will say he is the ruler forever and ever and ever. Uh, amen, amen, amen. So I think that we should say amen now, uh, as we will say in, in the future and for eternity. Uh, amen is a wonderful word, or amen is what we like to say. I think most people say amen. I say amen. Uh, and uh, it, it means this is true. We have no doubt of it. Uh, it's a doxology. I mean, lots of hymns end in, in, in doxology. Uh, it's singing praise to God. That's what a doxology is. Uh, so this is saying praise to, to Christ. You know, we even add to our Lord's Prayer, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, he's going to come. This isn't going to be a reign that will end. You know, you read in Scripture, you know, David had a great reign, uh, but then it ended. Then you had Solomon. He had a great reign. You know, he had some hiccups, but mm-hmm. then it ended. He died. Uh, all the kings died. The kingdom was destroyed. Well, this is a kingdom that will not end. Uh, the, the temple was great. But then, you know, after a few hundred years, it was destroyed. Oh, they built another temple. That was really good. And then it got destroyed. Uh, but uh, Christ's kingdom will never end. Mm. Uh, and I think that's what we should emphasize. And that means that our life will never end. Eternal life is eternal life with Christ. So there's no other kind of eternal life. Pastor Price, we have about three minutes left on the morning. Uh, reflecting on this text from Charles Wesley, Lo, he comes with clouds descending. How how does a Christian make use of this text devotionally, not only during the season of Advent, but throughout the year? Well, I think uh, this should encourage us to listen to so this whole thing that you're doing with these things, but uh, with this one included. Uh, this should encourage us to pay attention to the words that uh, we're singing. Mm. You know, sometimes people come to church, you might find it hard to believe. They'll come and we'll sing hymns, and they'll just sit there with their mouths closed and their mm. hymnals closed, just waiting for the hymn to be over. Remarkable. People actually do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't do that. Sing the hymns, even if you're not very good at singing, and look at the words, meditate on them. Because uh, you're going to learn more. I mean, I've sung this hymn, I don't know how many times I've sung it, and preparing for this little interview. Uh, you know, I learned more about the hymn. That's the, that's the way it works. Uh, the one, pay attention to the hymn, and the other is uh, Christ's return is imminent. It's going to happen. He's coming. Uh, this is true. We say amen to it. Uh, and this is something that should uh, drive us to actually realize that uh, the things that distract us in this life are not the most important. The kids' soccer game... Uh, you know, the, the choir rehearsal, your job, your mortgage, all these different things that we get so caught up in in this world. They're not as important because Christ is going to return. So how are we going to be ready? How are we going to prepare for that? Well, we should gaze upon those scars now. Uh, we should hear the gospel now. Um, there's lots of things that you can cut out in your life. Something's got to give. You know, that's an expression. Yeah, something's got to give. Yeah, you're right. Something's got to give. It must never be the gospel. It must never be God's work. Uh, otherwise, you may be deeply wailing. Um, so we should fight against apathy, sin, and unbelief by remembering that Christ will return. And we want to be ready for that, that we will welcome him with hallelujah. Uh, and the only way you do that is by hearing the gospel, by receiving the means of grace. So we should regularly go to church, regularly have devotions, and we should have hymns like Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending and other great hymns uh, as part of those devotions that we sing with our family and, uh, and keep, keep in mind as we go about our day. Um, you know, when people hum you know, secular pop music and such, uh, it's a little bit cringeworthy, uh, but uh, I think it's much better to hum and, and sing to yourself these great hymns that profess the faith. Pastor James Preuss is pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Ottumwa, Iowa, helping us today to study the hymn, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending, number 336 in Lutheran Service Book. Pastor Preuss, thanks for being our guest today. Yeah, thank you. 
Lo, he comes with clouds descending. Christ will return. Look, lift up your heads, dear Christian. Your redemption is drawing near. Look for that day. Anticipate that day that you might receive him with joy, the one who bears the scars that he earned, winning your salvation. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about these Advent hymns, you'd like to just let us know where you're listening, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It's always a joy to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.